August 31st in the year 2000, the people of Bath and Woolwich celebrated the official opening of the Sagadahawk Bridge. Two or three years earlier, the, the, uh, they had the opening of the bridge in Portland, and I live in the Portland area, and they had a two-day celebration and party on the bridge, which they were able to do before opening it. And I thought to myself, how stupid, who would want to go have a party for a bridge? And then I ended up being the chairman of the committee to run a party for the bridge, and we had a lot of fun doing it. A marvel of engineering and design, a record-breaking project, the Sagadahawk Bridge was the culmination of more than 20 years of dreaming, planning, politicking, and old-fashioned hard work. Of course, the beginnings of this bridge go back further than 20 years, much, much further. The history of this region is inseparable from the mighty river that defines it, and crossing that river has challenged our imagination, our patience, and our pocketbooks since the earliest settlements. A ferry of some sort began plying the Kennebec as early as 1718, Called Mayans Ferry, it was propelled by ore and was just large enough for a man and his horse. The Sagadahawk Ferry Company began the days of modern ferry service in 1834, and through the following decades the operation grew bigger and better, transporting passengers, then trains, and finally automobiles. By 1920, big ferries like the Hockamock and the Governor King were carrying over 50,000 cars across the river. The ferries ran every half hour, but the wait to get on board often tried people's patience. It is no uncommon thing to see half a mile of cars held up from one to three hours. N. Gratz Jackson, president of the Kennebec Bridge Association, 1925. The need for a bridge to cross the Kennebec might have been apparent to all, but getting to construction involved plenty of dreaming, planning, and politicking. In 1925, State Senator Frank W. Carlton of Woolwich, shown center, introduced legislation that eventually led to the construction of the bridge named in his honor. A massive PR campaign was launched to drum up support, culminating in a statewide radio address urging voters to support a $3 million bond referendum for the bridge's construction. The first piling for the first pier was driven in June of 1926. The substructure was built by the Foundation Company of New York and involved working with cement inside watertight coffer dams. Here, a caisson is built at Bath Iron Works and launched near the ferry service area. The superstructure was constructed by McClintic Marshall Company of Pittsburgh. Spans were brought down the river on barges and set upon the piers in stages. On August 15, 1927, Tugboats battled high winds and tides for two hours to move the 880-ton, 242-foot-long draw span into position. The last steel span was placed September 28, 1927. The Carlton Bridge opened to rail traffic on October 24, and vehicular traffic on November 15, 1927, both times with ceremony. But the formal celebration to dedicate the new bridge occurred on July 2, 1928, and included a pageant reflecting the historical events of Maine's early history, with a cast of over a thousand. The Boston Symphony Orchestra played, and an audience upward of 10,000 filled a stadium built for the occasion near Mill Pond on what is now McMahon Field. The dedication of the Carlton Bridge marks an epoch in transportation and brings the dawn of a new era in the development of the counties of Lincoln and Knox, Maine's Governor Ralph O. Brewster. Recent memory, the bridge has always been there. And uh, it it's, takes some getting used to the new one, to be honest with you. By the early 1970s, heavy traffic and long delays getting across the Kennebec River were once again spurring people in the Bath area to action. In 1981, a group of residents, business leaders, and politicians began meeting to lay the groundwork for a new bridge. A new bridge that would take nearly 20 years to complete. With 25,000 vehicles per day crossing the Carlton Bridge, the narrow roadway was overwhelmed. Add the congestion caused by Bath Ironworks shift changes, and rising summer tourism and delays began to resemble those of the early 1900s. Oh yes, yes. And then the night we had a, a car, I don't remember if it was a car or a van, went over the, the viaduct right above my office. Yeah. 
went right over and down on below. We, we, everything was piled up, all backed up, and then no brakes, and the thing went right up and over. Nobody was hurt. I couldn't believe it. It took 15 years until 1996 before a consensus was reached to build a new, high-level, four-lane fixed bridge parallel to the Carlton Bridge. With $38 million in federal funding set to expire, the Maine Department of Transportation began to look for a single contractor to design and build the new crossing. The winning team was Flatiron Structures LLC of Longmont, Colorado, and Fig Bridge Engineers of Denver, with both the highest technical score, 92, and the lowest price, $46.6 million. Much credit for the success of this three-way partnership goes to Maine DOT Commissioner John Melrose and construction manager Phil Pinkham. We had an excellent relationship with uh, Flatiron uh, and the designer that is the design-build project that con the engineers work for the contractor, which is a little different arrangement, arrangement but uh, it went well. Uh, I think we've got a bridge that looks well, that's been accepted well by the community and uh, should stay around for about 75 to 100 years anyway. The design called for a superstructure of trapezoidal concrete box girders supported by piers sunk into the Kennebec. To minimize the number of piers in the water, Flatiron Fig determined that the optimal solution was to make the spans as long as practicable. One of these spans at 420 feet is the longest balanced cantilever precast concrete segmental span in the United States. Construction began in the fall of 1997 at a project site just upriver from the bridge location. 202 concrete segments were cast at the yard, while the supporting piers were built in the water and on shore. The city of Bath and town of Woolwich were very much involved in the project, and to encourage community involvement, a public meeting was held to discuss the design. Community members had the opportunity to select certain features of the bridge that were outside the requirements of the contract, like the style of deck lighting, the finished color of the bridge, and the texture of the pier columns. Another way the community had a say was in naming the new bridge. Residents were asked to suggest names and the list was narrowed to six. Jars were set up in the Bath and Woolwich town offices and people voted with pennies. The clear favorite and eventual official name was the Sagadahawk Bridge. Jane Palmer and John Brill and Bill King uh, came down to ask the Ironworks if they would help them with uh, the dedication materials they needed for the dedication. And quite often the Ironworks will do that. They, they will send me out to help uh, different organizations, nonprofit groups. And it, uh, it started out that they needed some stationery and I designed some stationery for them. I had a granddaughter born uh, this year, uh, in January actually. And uh, I put her name on the back of the cabin cruiser. So it says M or two on the back, T O O, meaning also. Uh, and that's the one boat in there. It's the boat I would like to have had at some point in time. I'm too old to do it now, but uh, as a young guy, I would like to have had one of those big down east cruisers. It's a wonderful bridge. I mean, it's, uh, and I'm amazed at the people who uh, were so down on the just the design of it. Pretty exciting. May 5th, 2000. Finally, after all the dreaming, all the planning, negotiating, compromising, after all the hard work, the time had come to open the first lane of the new Sagadahawk Bridge. <laughs>